So in this video I'm going to prove the generalised mean value theorem, also sometimes abbreviated to the GMVT. And this is a simple corollary of the mean value theorem, and it's useful to know in several proofs that we'll do later in this playlist. So whilst the mean value theorem is just about one function, the generalised mean value theorem is about two functions. So we'll have two functions that we'll call f and g, and they're both going to be real valued functions defined on the closed bounded interval a, b. And we're going to need them to obey the normal criteria for being able to apply the mean value theorem to both of them, i.e. we'll need both of them, f and g, to be continuous on all points within the closed interval a, b and we're going to need them to be differentiable everywhere on the open interval AB, so everywhere apart from the two endpoints. These are the normal requirements to be able to apply the mean value theorem to F and the mean value theorem to G. Then the generalised mean value theorem says that there exists a number C within the interval AB, the open interval AB, so properly between A and B, such that this statement is true, that the derivative of f evaluated at c times the difference between the value of the function g at the upper endpoint of the interval and the value of the function g at the lower endpoint of the interval, i.e. gb minus ga, is equal to kind of the mirror image thing, i.e. g prime, the derivative of the function g evaluated at this point c, times now the difference between the function f at the upper endpoint of the interval minus the function f at the lower endpoint of the interval. Now, with a bit of rearrangement, this statement can be rearranged into this, provided, of course, that the things that we're dividing through by here aren't equal to zero. So if this derivative here isn't equal to zero, you can divide both sides through by it, and if this thing, g of b minus g of a, isn't equal to zero, again, you can divide both sides through by it, and that will then produce us this here, where we've got f prime of c over g prime of c is equal to f of b minus f of a over g of b minus g of a. So if you can make this manipulation, what this is saying is that there is a point in this open interval a, b, such that the quotient of the derivative of the function f at this point by the derivative of the function g at this point is equal to this quotient here, which is f of b minus f of a over g of b minus g of a. Now, if you think about multiplying top and bottom of this fraction here by 1 over b minus a, we can turn it into this thing here. So it's equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a all over g of b minus g of a over b minus a. And you can see now that what we're saying really is that there's a point in between a and b such that if you look at the ratio of the derivatives of the two functions at that point, it is the same as the ratio of the difference quotients at the, from the two endpoints of the interval for the function f and the function g. So this is the difference quotient for the function f going from a to b, and this is the difference quotient for the function g going from a to b. So I've just drawn a picture to try and illustrate this a bit more. So here is our interval a, b, and then I've drawn the function f here in black, and this is supposed to then represent the function g in blue here. And then I've drawn on these secant lines for the function f and the function g, going from the point a to the point b. So here is the secant line for the function f, and here is the secant line for the function g. And then this difference quotient here, f of b minus f of a over b minus a, that's the gradient of that secant line going from a to b. And this difference quotient here, g of b minus g of a over b minus a, this is the gradient of this secant line here for g going from a to b. And then the statement of this generalised mean value theorem is then that there exists some point C that's properly in between A and B, such that if you look at what the derivative of the function f at that point divided by the derivative of the function g at that point, it's the same as the um, difference quotient for f, i.e. the gradient of this red secant line, divided by the difference quotient for the function g, i.e. Uh, the gradient of this purple line here. 
So that I hope gives you some intuition for what this generalized mean value theorem is saying then. Now, of course, to go down this route of this interpretation here, we do need it to be the case that this isn't zero and this isn't zero. If it is the case that they are zero, one or both of them is zero, then of course, um, it doesn't work. You have to stick with the initial statement of the theorem that there exists the C is an element of this open interval AB such that this holds true. You can only make this manipulation um, in the case where you can divide through by those. So this is the best statement of the theorem, this, but this is helpful for understanding what this is really saying in multiple cases where you can divide through by these things. So I've erased all of that now because that was all just to try and give you a bit of intuition. This is the proper correct statement of the generalized mean value theorem and we'll now proceed and prove it. So this proof is actually really simple. So what we're going to do is define a new function which, so that it's got a name, we can call it h. And it again is going to be a function defined on this same closed interval a, b, and it's going to be real valued. And this is how it's going to be defined. So it will take any x in this interval to this, h of x will be f of x, so whatever f maps x onto, times this constant, which is g of b minus g of a. So your function g is defined, it's got some value at b and it's got some value at a, so you can take the value at b and the value at a, you can subtract the value of a from the value of b, and you'll get some real number. So this is just a constant in front of this. And then we'll have minus g of x, so whatever the function g would map your x onto, and then times another constant, which is f of b minus f of a. So again, b is mapped onto something by f, a is mapped onto something by f. You can then subtract f of a from f of b and you'll get another real number. So this is just a real number times f of x minus a real number times g of x. So now what I want to do is apply the mean value theorem to my function h, and I'll find that this result drops out of that. Now, in order to apply the mean value theorem to h, I need it to be the case that h obeys these conditions, i.e. that it is continuous on the closed interval a, b, and differentiable on the open interval a, b. So let's start with understanding why it's continuous on the closed interval a, b. So it, remember, is a constant times f of x plus a constant times g of x. So if I combine the minus and the f of b minus f of a, that just makes another real constant. So it is just a constant times f of x plus a constant times g of x. And I know that the functions f and g are continuous everywhere on the closed interval a, b. So I need to just argue why, therefore, a linear combination of those two functions is also continuous on the interval a, b. So this is just a little bit of a use of the algebra of limits for limits of functions. So let's start by just demonstrating to ourselves that a constant multiple of a function that is continuous is also going to be continuous. So we'll take our function f, it's continuous everywhere on this interval a, b. So if I take a point p in that interval, it will be continuous at that point. And now what I want to think about is, is the function lambda of f continuous at that point p? And I need to therefore ask the question, what is the limit as x approaches p of lambda of f? Is it equal to the function lambda of f evaluated at p, which of course would just be lambda times f of p by definition? Well, by the algebra of limits for limits of functions, this is just equal to lambda times the limit of the function f as x approaches p. That is true, provided that this limit exists. So the algebra of limits tells us that if this limit exists, then this limit also exists, and it's just equal to lambda times that limit. So because this limit does exist, because we know that the function f is continuous at the point p, therefore we can apply this result. So we know that this is equal to lambda times this limit, and then again, because the function f is continuous, this limit exists, and moreover, we know what it's equal to. We know that it's just equal to the function evaluated at p, so we can replace this by the function evaluated at p, so we therefore get that it's lambda times f of p. But of course, this is just equal to the function lambda of f evaluated at p, so we've therefore shown that the limit as x approaches p of lambda of f is just equal to lambda of f evaluated at p. Hence, it is continuous at p. And since we could apply this to a general p in that closed interval a, b, uh, we hence have that uh, it is continuous over 
the closed interval AB, this function lambda times f. So a constant times this function f is going to be continuous everywhere over the closed interval AB. So we know that this bit is continuous everywhere over that closed interval. Now, we could equally well apply this argument to the function g times a constant because it's continuous everywhere over that closed interval. So we know that this bit is also continuous. So now we just need to demonstrate that the sum of two continuous functions is also continuous. And that, again, is just an algebra of limits job. So I've written this out here. So if we have two functions, f and g, that are continuous at a point p, and we're now asking, is the sum of the two functions continuous at the point p? Then we need to know, uh, is the limit as x approaches p of f plus g equal to just f at p plus g at p, i.e. the sum, the function that is the sum of the two evaluated at p. So by the algebra of limits, this is equal to the limit as x approaches p of f plus the limit as x approaches p of g. This equality holds true provided that these two limits exist. If these two limits exist, then this limit will exist and it will be equal to the sum of the two. Now, these two limits do exist because these functions are continuous at P. So these limits must exist and we know indeed what they're equal to. This is equal to this function F evaluated at P and this one is equal to this function G evaluated at P. So this is F evaluated at P plus G evaluated at P. But of course, that is just equal to the sum of the two evaluated at P. And hence, this limit is exactly what we need it to be. It's just this some function evaluated at the point p. And again, because we could have applied this to any p in that interval, we therefore know that the sum of two continuous functions over this closed interval a, b is also continuous over that closed interval a, b. Now, of course, a slightly subtle point. Uh, at the two boundary points a and b, the limits that we're doing here will be half limits uh, coming from the right in the case of a and coming from the left in the case of b. But the whole theory still works for those half limits at those boundary points. Everywhere else, it'll be the full limit from both sides, uh, but the, the boundary points, the functions f and g aren't necessarily even defined on the other sides of the boundary, uh, so we, they will just be half limits there. But the theory applies for the half limits just as well as it does for two-sided limits. So from what I've just argued here, we can now conclude that this function h is continuous everywhere on the closed interval a, b because what I argue firstly here is that this constant times f is continuous everywhere on the closed interval a, b, and this constant minus f of b minus f of a times g, this function is also continuous everywhere on the closed interval a, b, so that's this bit. And then I've got these two functions that are continuous everywhere on the closed interval a, b, and I'm adding the two of them together, and that's what this bit argued that their sum will therefore also be continuous everywhere on the closed interval a, b. So I can conclude that the function h is continuous everywhere on the closed interval a, b. So that's the first thing that I need in order to apply the mean value theorem to h satisfied.